There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. You know, knowing the details of what everyone's up to, you know, these things loom larger than they need to be. It's like, oh, why did you, you know, buy the latte at work? Couldn't you just bring coffee? Like, that probably doesn't matter too much. And um, But some people think, you know, these are big deals. Uh, or maybe we have, like, different interests or passions and uh, hobbies, and we don't understand each other's worlds in that sense. Um, my wife is a needle pointer. Um, I have occasionally stumbled across invoices for what these things cost. It's not what I would have expected. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Hello there. Welcome back to the show. I am Shauna. This is Everyone's Talking Money. And I just wanted to give a big thanks to Tasha, who wrote this review for the show. She says, I love this podcast. It helped me seriously like money a lot more. And I can have conversations without freaking out. So many great episodes. And I always leave each episode knowing a bit more than I did before. So please don't stop. Tasha, thank you so much for this review. I'm so excited that you're a listener, and I always love when somebody gets something great out of each episode. I know not every episode is for everyone, but if you could just take away one thing from each episode, then I kind of consider it job well done. So if you've not left a review for the show, I would love, be honored to have you leave a review. You can add right to the link in the show notes, or you can leave a review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this episode in right now. All right. I want you to raise your hand. Are you a tightwad or a spendthrift in your relationship? I have to admit it, honestly, (laughs) I am mostly the tightwad. But don't get me wrong, I do love to spend money too. But get this, 
tightwads are more likely to marry spendthrifts than they are to marry someone like themselves. That's what motivated our guest, Scott Rick, a behavioral scientist at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business, to write his new book, Tightwads and Spendthrifts, Navigating the Money Minefield in Real Relationships. So he was in search of one answer. Can seemingly opposing financial personalities coexist peacefully? It's a good question. In this episode, we're going to get to the bottom of it all. We're going to talk about how do you make peace with your partner? What is financial infidelity? Why financial translucency, aka not sharing all the details of what we spend our money on, could actually save a lot of partnerships? And how to talk to your kids about money so they don't mimic your tightwadness or your spendthriftness. So grab your partner or just slide this episode their way after you listen. It is a great way to open up a money conversation. All right, let's start. The premise of your new book, it it revolves around this one question. What if I'm a tightwad and my significant other is a spendthrift? And we already know that it is just like a landmine when we're talking about couples and money and trying to, you know, manage money together. I think let alone if you're at, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum of, of how you, you know, quote unquote, do money. So I thought, like, let's just start here. How do I know if I am the tightwad or the spendthrift in my own relationship? Sure. No. Uh, so we have a scale, a little questionnaire that people can fill out. I, I think most couples have a, a sense of how these things are going, but it can be, I think, useful to get it on paper and get some feedback and see where you stand relative to kind of thousands of people who have already completed the scale. And, um, you know, that can give some useful context uh, in the relationship. Uh, certainly, it, you know, I'm, I'm a spendthrift and I'm married to a tight wad. And, <laughs> um, you know, it, it helps to interpret some otherwise ambiguous behaviors, like some gifts from me to her or from her to me. And, It's not just kind of a pure signal of how much we love each other or how much we understand about each other, but it's also kind of, oh, how comfortable you are or I am spending money and how we use money to express affection. And so it's it's kind of a useful like, oh, yeah, that that there's you've got that going on. It's interesting as you're as you're talking I'm trying to think in my own marriage. I think it's it's weird like I have tendencies of being a tightwad and then tendencies of being a spendthrift. I think it like depends on the situation. I would I would kind of say the same thing about my husband. Interesting enough, we grew up in very different backgrounds and and money the relationship with money and how money was talked about dealt very different. Um I, you you say though that Tightwads and spendthrifts are more likely to marry one another than they are to marry someone like themselves. I find this hmm. like really interesting. Tell me about yes. this. You know, first I should mention that, you know, on our, our scale, <clears throat> I focus on the tightwads and spendthrifts. They're kind of the extreme ends of the distribution, but there's a middle ground of what we call unconflicted consumers. Uh, and it sounds like you and your husband might be there. Um and, you know, that's kind of a happy place to be where you, you're sometimes one, sometimes the other. They tend to be kind of happiest. Um, th- th- you know, they they kind of spend more or less what they think they should, whereas the tightwads are spending less than they think they should. Spendthrifts are spending more than they think they should. And both of those extremes are kind of conflicted um, in their right. approach to money. And when you have something about yourself that's kind of, bothersome or kind of um, some of your self-conscious about, you don't love to see that reflected in someone else. It shines like a really <laughs> uncomfortable spotlight on it. Um, and so you might initially be kind of repelled by people who have like your problem. Um, and so that's why we think at first it's kind of fun to be with someone who approaches money very differently. It's kind of fascinating and funny and charming. Um, but, you know, over time, it gets a little trickier once you get into, like, bigger decisions. You know, when you move from dating to uh, where to live and where the kids go to school and should we remodel. And now those differences that were kind of charming and fun are, like, 
Uh, a little <laughs> really annoying. Yeah, really yeah. annoying. <laughs> yes. Yeah, hence like the conflict, right? That that comes up, and you're like, I used to find you really charming, and now you're what just happened? annoying yes. me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so can can these two like polar opposite type people, can they coexist in like a really financially peaceful environment or like how do they get to that place? Sure. Well, part of it is over time you kind of can fix each other a bit and kind of move towards uh, the center. And we see that relationships that do kind of survive over time, you do see a little movement some convergence over time. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, you know, the couples where you don't converge, you know, you see a lot of fighting or they're not a couple anymore. You know, <laughs> they kind of fall out of the sample scientifically speaking, but um, so there's that. Uh, but, you know, there's also kind of how money moves in the household and what we know about our partner and how they use money. And I do think account structure can be a way to kind of minimize unnecessary friction over money. So the the structure that I love, and I have some research to support this, is like all incoming money gets laundered through a joint account. Uh, so it's all our money. Um, there's no kind of yours and mine. It's, it's just all ours. Uh, but then we each have a separate account attached to that joint account. Um, and so, you know, we each can take from the joint account as needed. Maybe that's on a schedule. We agree like, Oh, we each get X per month. Um, so we each get a little piece of our money to spend kind of without close monitoring. Um, Cause you know, knowing the details of what everyone's up to, you know, these things loom larger than, they need to be. It's like, oh, why did you, you know, buy the latte at work? Couldn't you just bring <laughs> coffee? Like, that <laughs> right. probably doesn't matter too much. And, um, but some people think, you know, these are big deals. Uh, or maybe we have like different interests or passions and, uh, hobbies and we don't understand each other's worlds in that sense. Um, my wife is a needle pointer. Um, I have occasionally stumbled across, invoices for what these things cost. It's not what I would have expected, right? It's, <laughs> right. Um, but whenever you're not like an expert in something, you can't tell the difference between like the good or bad version of it. Like if I know nothing about art, it's so like an art print is going to look like, I don't know, is that the real thing? So we don't have the the expertise to kind of judge each other's spending. So as long as we can kind of keep it within some agreed upon general number, I think the details are just unhelpful. Um, so it's, you know, you hear a lot about financial transparency within relationships. I, I say, well, how about financial translucency? Like it's, you, you get a sense, but the details they're available upon request and hopefully the requests are few and far between. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I came up with this idea a few years ago I, when I was a practicing financial planner and I worked with a lot of couples and it was more of, I was more of a therapist than I was actually, you know, helping them with their money. And so I really got firsthand knowledge of the behavioral side of money and the relationship with money and and how much about money and and uh, how we interact with money and certainly how we do it in relationship uh we we just don't understand because we don't spend time like exploring well how did i grow up and what patterns am i mimicking and you know what generational traumas kind of come through and like all of these big things that play at this this big role and I was working with a couple and I, I came up with this idea of, I, I called it a don't ask, don't mm. tell spending limit. And so it was this dollar amount that you could you could agree on that each other could spend up to that amount. And there were no questions. There were no judgment. Like there was just nothing, you know, and I, I like what you're saying here because this this idea of translucency is like, okay, I have I have an idea, but you also have some sort of free reign to to spend money and and maybe that can create like a like a healthy you know coexistence. I think so. I think so. And, and you can build in. I think you can build in um, some guardrails. I, I think the first step is 
like, oh, let's, um, you know, I, I have a sense that we've been pulling stuff out of the joint account, maybe more than we planned on. Can we do some self audits? Um, all I need to hear from you is that you did it. I kind of trust you to look, look over your numbers. And if you see something's amiss, uh, you know, I trust you to kind of address that. Now you're always free to say, I'd love to get another pair of eyes on this and invite someone in. And that's great. And we should do that as desired. But the, the default I think is we have some autonomy, some individuality that we get to maintain a little privacy. Um, whereas yes, I just, we need to know kind of the big number, but not the components. You know, where do you think like some of the uh, the landmines exist, like with couples that don't set up kind of these these boundaries and guardrails and and have these conversations? Is it is it largely because we don't maybe understand our own thoughts and feelings around money, and so we bring them into a relationship and we start projecting things like judgment and shame and all of these things that like you know, we're not comfortable with ourselves. And then it just creates like an even bigger eruption in a relationship. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, eruptions in romantic relationships and just any interpersonal relationships, kind of not kind of understanding where you're coming from and why. And um, I, I do think that's a useful exercise. Um, you know, filling out a, a scale is like one version of that. Um, you know, it, it, as I'm sure you've discovered over the years, like talking with trained um, professionals is also kind of a useful thing to do to, to explore that. And, um, but no, it, it's helped kind of, uh, again, just kind of knowing where we're coming from and, um, you know, given how you react to um, money and anxieties around money, I know how you'll interpret this question or I have a sense of how you'll interpret it or this gift or suggestion. So it, it, it really does help to kind of um, navigate that minefield. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, it takes a lot of learning and curiosity about kind of um, your partner. That That's one of the things I mentioned in the book. Like you might feel like you really know each other Um <laughs> But, you know, if you audit, like, recent conversations, like, if you just kind of recorded what you've been talking about, a lot of it's going to be, oh, who's taking the kid to soccer practice? And, like, a lot of, like, immediately practical things, but not really, like, Depth. delving into their psychological world, which is really important. So so speaking about that, you are a behavioral scientist, and I love that the book is written from that perspective because that's that's certainly my jam. One of the things that you argue kind of along this line is that we're more likely to mimic the behavior we see our parents do versus what they say about money. I, I, I love this idea. Like, how does this influence our like current spending? You know, how did whatever our parents did, how does that influence us now? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it depends on when your now is. I, I don't think we come out as like, young adults um, looking and acting just like our parents. But as we start to age and confront some of the similar choices that they confronted, I think we do start to kind of mimic more of what we saw. So eventually you do see kind of kids somewhat churning into their parents um, on, on That's money. That's scary, dimensions. Scott. <laughs> I know. I know. And, and, and this was like a useful um, thing for me to research because <clears throat> I have three young kids, three young boys and very, you know, impressionable. And, um, you know, I don't necessarily want them to be a spendthrift to the degree that I am. Uh, you know, I want them to enjoy life, but maybe, you know, be careful out there. Um, so I'll tell them things, um, like, uh, oh, maybe we don't need to spend that money just yet. Hold on, hold on. Um, but then they'll see me do stuff. And uh, that may be very much at odds with um, what I'm telling them. Uh, you know, if I'm telling them to hold on to the gift money from grandma and then I just like buy the new iPhone for myself when I already have a perfectly fine one, you know, 
that that gets muddled. Um, but yeah, so what we see is that the the what they see you doing is a much better predictor of what they end up doing than kind of what they hear. Um, but what yeah, what they're hearing is usually, you know, these extremes are kind of saying, well, don't be like me. Do as I say, not as I do, but they often do as you do. How do you do that research? <laughs> like how how do you find out, you know, these these mm. kind of like trends? Yeah. So well, one interesting method is uh, we bring parents and kids into a, a lab and like a real kind of, it feels like a living room. And we give them like money scenarios to talk through, um, just like where it's not clear what these characters should do. And, um, you know, the kid says, oh, maybe this character should keep their money and not buy the toy. And the parent will say, it's okay to buy a little toy. Or, you know, we, we see kind of how the parents respond to the kids and we see kind of the extremes kind of suggesting you don't have to be as extreme as me. Mm, okay. um, yeah. So they're kind of reeling in their kids a little bit. Um, but how the kid ends up behaving, like if we let them loose in a little laboratory store um, and give them money to buy toys, it's it's much closer to kind of how the parent behaves and how the parent verbally guides them. Okay. So kind of knowing this perspective, then if we have kids or let's say we're we're getting ready to have a kid, mm-hmm. how do we talk to our kids about money? And, and you know, I, you know, I, I think, you know, how do we teach them about money knowing that like our complexity with money is like so complicated it, it, just itself? Yes. Layers upon layers. Um, yeah. No, it's, you know. One thing it's helped me to recognize is like, oh, they don't kind of arrive on the planet kind of knowing what that credit card means and kind of, um, you know, that just seems like a free uh, gift card to them. And um, so kind of spelling out, well, what this means is I do this because, of course, you keep in mind that later I'll have to pay money to this bank. and. Um, So I try to, you know, get those kind of basic financial literacy things. um, And and they enjoy talking about that and learning about that. Um, And, you know, I, even if something is not really painful for me to spend the money on, because I am a spendthrift, I might kind of act, perform some pain (laughs) just to um, (laughs) make them think it's not like a hot knife through butter for me, like, oh, oh I don't know. Um, okay, right. There's, and a, little, there's a little a drama, while, right? A little, yeah. I'll just, I think, like, what would my wife do? Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll say what she would say. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, and then occasionally I'll be like, oh, maybe I don't have to buy that thing that I would just normally buy on my own. Um, or maybe this can be an online purchase after they go to bed. Like, they, you know, there are things that they don't need to see every single thing, but, um, yeah, it's just kind of being mindful that they will um, – it's not just kind of the explicit suggestions that they're going to pick up. It's really kind of right. um, a true mimicry that is is waiting to happen there. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, 
in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news? Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. All right, Scott, so we're going to play your relationship with money is game. So question number one, if you had to describe your relationship to money as a cartoon character, who would it be? It's tough. It would... I think it would certainly be someone from the Looney Tunes universe. Um, I, you know, as a spendthrift, I kind of uh, feel like Tweety Bird. Like, um, you know, he kind of gets himself in trouble. Like Sylvester often grabs him, but you know, more or less, it us- there's usually a happy ending. So I'm, uh, I haven't yet been kind of eaten by the metaphorical Sylvester, but, um, and you know, the Tweety Bird seems to have kind of a fun swing in life, and. Um, you know, as a spendthrift, that's where I like to dance, like a little risky, a little fun, um, have to get out of some jams every now and then, but I, I think that's me. <laughs> All right. Question number two, what first thought comes to mind when you think about money? Yeah. The, the first feeling um, is probably some anxiety, um, but mild, um, but it's more about um, situations involving money. Uh, oh, there's, uh, we got to close on our loan for the remodel. We got to, um, figure out a way to pay for, um, you know, my mom recently moved to town. Like there were some decisions that had to be made there. And so it's, it's more anxiety around kind of just like taxing, money involved decisions. Um, yeah, but mild, I think. All right. Question number three, if you had an endless supply of money, what's the first thing you would spend it on? Well, you know, I do love to dazzle the children. So I would, um, you know, they're into baseball cards and 
they've gotten me back into it. So I, I certainly they would get like autographs from their favorite people, and <laughs> if not just flying to the right. games to be in the front row, um, probably in that neighborhood. All right, last question. What is one money secret you have that maybe you haven't shared very often? In writing the book, I think I kind of explored some some of the past, some of my past. And, um, you know, I grew up in Houston, but a lot of my time was spent in Vegas. Um, my grandparents lived with us in Houston and they kind of got bored and they said, we love you, but we're moving to Vegas. And that was kind of sad, but we were like, oh, we get to visit. And so I spent a lot of summers as a youth, just like hanging out in casinos and it's pretty fun. Um, I looked older than I was, which was fun then. It's it's less fun now, but um, so I didn't get too much trouble from the security guards. Um, but it was a very interesting uh, look at like non-optimal financial decisions, let's say. Um, and not, you know, some of them were bad, but they weren't terrible. Um, so it was an interesting you know, daily exposure to this balancing of financial and psychological well-being um, that I, I feel like I've kind of carried that desire for balance into my adult life. Um, and yeah, sometimes you see people who seem to be kind of too high on one or the other, but I try, I strive for a balance uh, from my Vegas childhood. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. Daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. Hey, Mel. Bri here. Gotta work from home today because the whole family caught a nasty. Daddy! Hey, Mikey! If you're gonna puke, find the popcorn bowl! But my availability is 110%. Coincidentally, so is my fever. <laughs> Kidding. Mel, I'm so cold but hot. Uh, but I'm going to get you that budget. Just as soon as... Right. Mikey! Popcorn bowl! Press 1 to use Instacart and get your family's sick day essentials delivered in as fast as 30 minutes. Press 2 to keep working. Do not press 2. Just use Instacart. Brian. You know, I've read a lot of articles. Um, I, I've done a lot of talking about money trauma, and um, I'm a certified trauma of money specialist. And, you know, I think that there's a, a lot of research that still needs to be kind of done in that area. And, you know, there isn't a specific diagnosis like there is, you know, PTSD mm. or anything like that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that um, I learned that I really think has a kind of great importance is, when your parents didn't talk at all about like the things that they didn't say, you were still picking up cues and um, you were developing this kind of unconscious relationship or relatability to money that you didn't even know was there. So sometimes we talk about it like, what did our parents, you know, say or do? But what if there was like a void of all of that, but you still, you know, picked up some sort of trauma or response? I don't know. It's so fascinating to me. Like it's it's very, very layered, like an onion kind of peeling back. But I think it's it's really interesting. Yes, very much. Uh, and so, yeah, I try to debrief them on, on some items um, because you know we're we're exposed to a lot of inequality in in both ways, and um, 
you know, it's, it's hard for them to wrap their mind around. It's like, why can't we do what this other family did? And, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we can't explain every single choice that affects their economic lives, but we do try to, um, just tell them kind of the mechanics of the system and helping them understand the world that they live in. It's, uh, very tricky. Yes. Yeah. If you can, if you can explain that, I would, I would love to have you over to explain yeah, it to you. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So couples, so we have these different um, sort of spending habits. Are there things that we should be talking about like ahead of conflict? Like, should we spend more time talking about our thoughts and feelings around money or what's kind of really going on? Versus just, you know, you know, I'm blowing up because you're spending, you know, 150 bucks at Target every week. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, first step is, um, do I need to know how much you're spending at Target? Um, <laughs> but, um, and of course, what does it mean to spend X dollars at this place? Like, do I need to see the receipts? Like, it could mean so many different things. Um but again, as we discussed, like having those um, kind of uh, private individual accounts, um, seeing things at a high level. Uh, but no, it kind of getting to know um, what is on your partner's mind, what is stressing them out, what is um, kind of what are they looking forward to, what are they dreading. Um, these are useful things to explore. Um, and Um, and just uh, keeping in mind also that a lot of us kind of overweight the small stuff. Um, so yes, maybe it was a mistake to have bought that indulgence, uh, whatever the, the item is, but in the grand scheme of things, um, that's probably not the difference between kind of wealth and not wealth. It's, there are bigger systematic factors at play there. And um, so that, that kind of like deprogramming is, is also just helpful. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's also something interesting. We talked about the idea of financial translucency. You talk also about financial infidelity and that it, this has been used, you say like far too broadly in covering kind of harmless behaviors and that, you know, spending that's, we talked about spending that's out in the open is usually what gets couples in trouble. So tell me a little bit about like, what actually is financial infidelity hmm. then? Well, as far as I can tell, um, any behavior that falls short of complete proactive transparency is considered by many to be financial infidelity. Um, so one example um, from a pretty popular personal finance website, uh, I saw this and kind of stopped me in my tracks. So um, you go to the store, you go to a grocery store, you spend $100 on groceries, uh, you pay with debit card, and you withdraw $20 in cash on top of that. Um, and you don't tell me that. Mm-hmm. So if I see the bank activity, I'll see, oh, you spent $120 on groceries. I won't know that you had a little $20 spending spree. Um, And so the fact that you didn't disclose that is financial infidelity. Uh. To me, that seems kind of unduly strict. Um, I think for many of us, I don't care if you withdraw money and (laughs) don't tell me about it. Um, You know, things like, oh, um, does your spouse kind of tell you, how much they're spending on gifts for friends or family. Um, I mean, I, I don't tell this to my wife. She doesn't tell me. I, I don't care. Um, I I hope she does get her friends and family nice gifts. My goodness. <laughs> um, you know, so th- there are just um, things that we don't need to know. And so I think a lot of innocent, uh, perfectly functional behaviors are being label as financial infidelity. And, um, you know, I can understand why it gets a lot of attention and, um, but I don't know, it seems a little overblown to me. Um, now of course there are acts of truly deceptive financial behavior, 
secret addictions, uh, affairs. I mean, these are um, big problems. I, I'm not sure they're financial problems. I, they involve money, but um, they're not for someone like me to solve. I mean, you need uh, counseling and treatment. And um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, a different account structure is going to solve right, that. Right. <laughs> but yeah, as you note, I, I really think it's like the the unaffordable mortgage we both chose to enter into that's more likely to sink us than, you know, these little undisclosed financial decisions, um, you know, uh, moving to the wrong city when you don't have the income for it and um, sending the kids to private school when that's not affordable. It's Those are the the big ticket things that can really do yen. You, you put together this whole book. We've talked about so many different pieces of this, but I'm wondering, like, what are some of the biggest, like, ahas that you took away from, from all the research and kind of putting together this idea of, you know, managing money in a relationship? Yeah. No, I, I think I, um, certainly, um, the account structure insights were kind of a useful, um, aha moment. I'll call it a moment. It's kind of the result of like years of research kind of building to it, but, um, that, that has been quite useful. Um, certainly the children aspect, um, was a wake up call. Um, I do think through this process, I've learned to be a better gift giver, um, which, you know, might not sound like such a big deal, but it's like, these are big moments. There's a lot of them. If you're like a married parent in the United States, like you've got five or six locked in times per year where you need to produce a pretty good gift. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of advice out there like, oh, just ask them what they want uh, and get that. Uh, sure. I mean, it's very risk averse, I think. Uh, I mean, I guess it's meant to avoid a disaster, like, oh, here's a new ironing board or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I, I think my interpretation of kind of people's stories and the research is that it's really about kind of understanding your partner and uh, using this as an opportunity to kind of express that understanding and the appreciation that sometimes we're just too shy or tired to do verbally. Like we're more likely to appreciate our partners than to tell them mm, yeah, how much okay. we appreciate them or why it might just seem again, if we're having a conversation about very practical things and who's going to take the dog for a walk and like all these things, um, you know, it might feel too weird to bring up like, you know, these qualities that we admire about them. And it's just like, Okay, well, let's get back to the uh, grocery order here. <laughs> right. um, so, so yeah, these are the big moments for for a lot of us, and I think it's it's essential that we kind of be curious, take time to learn um, about each other, ask each other questions. I suggest some in the book. Um, there are questions that have been proposed for like strangers to like become really close within like an hour, but I say like, even in a marriage, you could use a refresher on some of this stuff. <laughs> right. Like, do I know like, Oh, who my spouse would love if they could have anyone over for dinner, who would it be? Like, I don't know. Um, but like hearing who they would pick, it's like, okay, interesting. Why would you pick that? Oh, you're thinking about, okay, that's good to know. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, that's been an essential insight. Has it helped your um, own relationship as you're, kind of going through this and like trying to see s this stuff from like another perspective too. Yeah, no, cause I, I used to be really bad. I'm less bad now, but I used to be really bad. Um, yeah. Like I, I tell one story in the book about um, early in the marriage, I knew she liked Kate Spade. And so it's like, okay, well I'll get her something from there. Um, you know, I, I knew she had other accessories. I was like, Oh, I'll get her a handbag. And, um, so I went to the place and I saw things that kind of looked like what she already had. And any one of those would have been fine. 
but then I saw this like really gold glittery over the top. Like if I'm, if I wore purses, that would be my purse. I, I like like a loud accessory, <laughs> uh, a fun sneaker, like things like that. And it was like way more expensive than the others. And I thought that is, that's love. That is, I'm going to wow her with that. And um, that's not her. It's just not her. And, and so we were with her family on that Christmas and she opened it in front of them. And this was in Pittsburgh or her, her close families from Pittsburgh. And they're like real Pittsburghers. Like they're not like, they're going to say not it fancy. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, they're perfectly lovely, but they're, yeah. And she opened it and it was just silence. Just, you could hear the tumbleweeds and the, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was just so clear that I had laid a, an egg and not a good egg. And her dad was like, Oh, you're going to wear that down at the Kroger's? Like, um, yeah, it was just so clearly expressing a misunderstanding of Julie, my wife. And, um, yeah. And so that, that hurt her. That really, and I thought, Oh, uh, I'll spend extra to show extra love, but it was actually just a big negative. Um, so that was quickly returned. <laughs> I would that, was imagine, back, right? that was back before New right. Year's. Um, but yeah, it's uh, as a spendthrift, my inclination is to spend to show affection. But a good gift requires sacrifice, I think. And spending for someone like me is no, it's no sacrifice. I do it all the time. If I want to sacrifice, I need to do some legwork. I need to plan something or track down um, some merch from a band she likes or, you know, a playbill from some show that she enjoyed. Like got to put in the effort. Her on the other hand, if she buys me something expensive and, you know, something that I like, of course, but that's a real gesture. Like I know it hurts her. Right. She had to let go of that money. Yes. And so for her, to me, that's, that means something. Um, so we have to demonstrate our sacrifice kind of based on kind of what we know about each other. And, um, so that, that has been very useful to kind of think through. So, you know, we're up on this time, like end of the year, beginning of the year, kind of starting where people are thinking a lot about money and goals and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, if we're if we're in a relationship and we're either the tightwad or the spendthrift, like how do you suggest, you know, th- this time of year, how do we come together? How do we embrace spending and and really I think do it from more of a, you know, sort of partnership aspect? Yeah. So, um certainly when we're jointly spending on others like kids or our parents, um you know, that, that's great to do together. Um, certainly, I should not be left to my own devices to buy the gifts for the kids because I'll go <laughs> overboard. And so it's it's a good, you know, she's my wife. She helps me kind of control myself, but and I kind of help her loosen up a little bit. And um, so hopefully couples can embrace that and, um, you know, recognize that there are some productive disagreements that can happen. And um, but again, with the new year coming up, I mean, that is the perfect time for a fresh start and um, a lot of behavioral science suggesting that these can be crucial moments to kind of fine tune your habits and approach to things. And, you know, I have a chapter in the book about how you can kind of take steps to loosen up as a tight wad or to reel yourself in as a spendthrift. And um, it's all kind of turning up or down the dial of how much attention you're paying to money leaving your possession when you're spending. So like, you know, I'm a spendthrift, but when I was in grad school, you know, money was extremely tight. Um, So I really had to like ratchet up my own pain around spending. And so I would only spend in cash and I would kind of train myself when I go to the ATM, that was a painful moment because the account got lower. And then when I would spend the cash, the wallet got lower. So that was like double pain. Um, you know, I'm not sure that's like a recipe for happiness, but 
just to get through a rough time, I was able to dial up the, the distress. Um, and if you're a tightwad, I think there are ways to dial it down. Um, you know, looking at things in terms of investments, um, you know, sometimes, uh, other people can help you reframe a, a purchase or a decision as an investment. That kind of thinking helps a tightwad. Um, getting kind of outside objective feedback on your financial situation. Like you can convince yourself like, oh, I'm going broke or, you know, sometimes hopefully not too often, but sometimes that can be true, but it can also help to kind of get someone else to say, oh, you look pretty good to me. Um, loosen up. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. So yes, uh, New Year is a great time to reset. I love this idea of financial translucency, right? Like not sharing all the details of what you spend your money on. I think it could really save so many partnerships, relationships out there. And like Scott was saying, we're not saying you should lie to your partner, but you shouldn't have to justify every little thing that you buy. I shared this in the episode, but I think it's a great idea to, to set this limit, this amount of money that you can spend without questions, without shame, without judgment. Any amount over that, yeah, you got to have a little conversation. But I, I think it's just a really healthy way to set up your money partnership so that there is still some freedom. But of course, there are you know some boundaries around there. It just it takes a little practice. If you want to grab a copy of Scott's book, Tightwad in Spendthrifts, it releases in early January, so you can go right now and pre-order it everywhere books are sold. If you enjoyed this episode, send it right now to your partner or to friends who are partners and tell them, all right, you got to listen to this on Tightwads and Spendthrifts. It is going to literally change your relationship. Hey, and I also want to give a big shout out to all of the sponsors for this episode who make this show possible. You can head right to the show notes to get all the links and all of the information that we talked about. I will see you back here, my friends, in a few days for a brand new episode. Music.